I've got you on because you've been talking about something on the England on 99.94 podcast, which I, find, which I find interesting. And I think in many ways, only you, me and Red Inca fans and maybe a few people on 99.94 will find interesting, which is that you don't know who England's vice captain is. And you also seem to be one of about seven people in the world bothered by the fact that you don't mm -hmm. know who England's vice captain is. So we know that when we've been watching the tests at times, two things have been really common, to, uh, really obvious. Bairstow seems to be talking more to Stokes than he ever did to Root. And when Stokes is off the field, quite clearly Root is moving the fielders around. Yes, we know that. But we have also been assured that Joe Root will not be vice captain because that would be kind of wrong and a retrograde step. So the evidence of our eyes is that to all intents and purposes, what we think a vice captain is on the field is the person who takes over the duties of the captain when the captain is not on the field. But the person who we think is doing that is definitely not the vice captain. So this is confusing. And then we thought we might get to crack it, Jared, at the Oval Test match when Stokes had finished a relatively long spell, not as long as his, you know, 14 over marathon in the previous test, but um, at Old Trafford. But he went off the field and we thought, yeah, he, he's got, he'll have some problems here, a bit of icing, that kind of thing. We're going to get 10 or 15 minutes to find out what's going on. And Stuart Broad came on to bowl from the pavilion end and we thought, hello, it's Broadie, isn't it? It is Broadie. At the end of this over, we're going to know because Stokes isn't going to bowl, so someone's mm. going to have to be brought on to bowl and whoever makes that decision is the captain, right? Isn't that how we understand what the captain's role on the field is? And if the captain isn't on the field, whoever makes that decision must be the vice captain. So we thought, aha, we're about to unlock the mystery that is only interesting to me, Rory Dollard, some Red Inca fans and you. <laughs> but, well, blow me if Stokes didn't come charging down the steps <laughs> at the end of that over and then put someone on to bowl. So the mystery remains intact. We do not know. Uh, I don't know why I care, but I think I care. Okay, let me just explain why I think I care. And it's because vice captains used to be something back in the 20s and 30s. And actually, I've just finished reading um, Being Jeffrey Boycott, which I think is a fantastic book with John Hong, in which, in Boycott's own words, the fact that he wasn't made vice captain for a couple of tours was really deleterious to his morale. He thought, oh, God, you know, I'm that much further away from being captain. So the, the vice captain had some kind of importance. And on tours, back in the day, before there was a million people in the, uh, in the backroom staff, the vice captain did have actually something of a role in that they would mm. help captain the side um, in, the, in the state games when the captain was resting, and they would help pick the side as part of a panel of, like, three people. There'd be the old duffer in the suit who had just finished going to secretary, you know, the, the director general's place or whatever they're called, um, and get hammered on champagne. And then they'd come back and pick the team with the captain, mm. the vice captain. I'm thinking like Bob Wyatt as vice captain to, to Douglas Jardine, that sort of thing. And then just of late, the vice captain has seemed to be, well, irrelevant because you've now got a million people. You've got selectors, you've got a huge backroom staff. Tours don't work the way they, they seem to. And also it, doesn't mean it's a stepping stone. So before in the 60s, like if you were vice captain on tour, that was a sort of little nod that you were the next in line to be captain if you're going to keep on being selected. Well, that is just not there anymore. So I suppose those are the myriad thoughts that were jumbling around inside my confused idiosyncratic brain. Yeah, and I think, you know, you and I both knowing about history, there's no doubt that for a long, long time, the vice captain was an incredibly important person. I mean, if you think of captain as the manager of the team, which in some ways they were the coach of the team, the vice captain was, you know, the assistant coach, um, you know, the assistant manager of, of that sort of team. The selection thing I think is a really important one that you mentioned before, like on tours, almost at home, a vice captain didn't mean much in cricket when you think about it, unless someone's actually got injured, but on tour, a vice captain is incredibly important, right? You know, of, of corralling the people together and making sure things work and literally selecting the 11, right? So that was an official role of a lot of vice captains in the world. And then when the coach comes involved in the 80s through to the 90s, that's when the vice captain sort of loses their power to a certain extent. And then the next bit of professionalism is selectors start to tour, right? So you start to get one selector touring. 
the next thing now is, of course, you now have selectors, you have general managers, you have high performance directors. So the vice captain doesn't really make any sense in all of that um, anymore. And yet we still have this term. Um, if you, there's two ways of looking at the vice captain. You've just talked about the, the, the future captain role, right? I always felt, especially in Australian mm -hmm. cricket, that actually a vice captain was someone who was supposed to have very little ambition more often than not. And their job was to just be the person who wasn't the captain, but still had some form of discipline, a little bit of leadership and, you know, push came to shove. They could still move the fielders around. And, um, you, you, we chatted just off air, um, beforehand, uh, when we were trying to work out if we could possibly string this out for, uh, 30 minutes. And, uh, on that, you said, you talked about Jeff Marsh, right? Almost. If you think about it, there is no way that Jeff Marsh was ever going to be made captain of Australia, and that didn't matter. But his ability to be a permanent vice captain and still be, you know, and and still be there was kind of quite important. So there's almost two kinds of vice captains. There is the one who's going to be the next captain, and there is the one whose job is just to make the captain feel more comfortable. Yeah, I think I think that's that's sort of right, isn't it? To, to make the captain feel more comfortable. Like the Jeff Marsh to Alan Border role is one that is very different from one that I think happens, well, or happened in English cricket for a long time. But I think actually the vice captain now in English cricket is a bit more like that, isn't it? It's a sort of, it's the support. It's not quite the hand of the king from Game of Thrones, although there's sort of an element to that. But there is a sort of, you know, united front um, we have a particular way of playing the game and the captain and vice captain embody those values. And you see it actually quite a bit in the one day set up in England. So Joss Butler, this is where the two things merge because Joss Butler, by being vice captain, was sort of then anointed as the next one down the line, you know, a bit Prince Charles in a sense. But at the same time, it was really that he bought in to the Owen Morgan way of playing and he was like the the actual embodiment of it, isn't he? I mean, he, well, he is the embodiment of it, if you think about it, that sort of aggressive, uh, high-risk approach. And so by leading from the front, you can have a captain, but then you you support that message by redoubling down, by having somebody who then practically goes out of his way, who you think, well, he could get dropped, couldn't he? Well, no, he's not going to get dropped because he's the vice captain. And if he gets out playing a high-risk shot, that doesn't mean that, you know, he's going to be dropped. It's for, to encourage the others, to encourage les autres, to allow Jason Roy to go and express himself, that kind of thing, you know. I mean, I'm using a very specific example there of the England one-day setup, mm. but that's sort of where the vice-captain does both those things. He is in no way ambitious to take over from Owen Morgan. Owen Morgan gets to keep the job for as long as possible. That's when he's like Prince Charles, but at the same time will become king once yeah. Owen Morgan goes. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that, I almost find that one is a more, and, and we, we see that from time to time where I don't think Butler, to go back to your Game of Thrones uh, thing, Butler is almost becomes captain because there's no one else. And because he doesn't massively want it, they almost trust him at a certain point. And if you look at, if you look at that Australian lineage, so I've got, I've got the Rod Marsh t-shirt on uh, here to, you know, for people actually watching on YouTube. Otherwise, all you heard was my chair move around a little bit on the podcast. Oh. Um, but you've got Rod Marsh, who eventually wanted to become captain, but certainly probably didn't want to become captain. When the chapels were around, he wasn't e that eager to become the captain, right? He's replaced by Jeff Marsh, who ha has zero interest in the captaincy, who's replaced by Mark Taylor, who is an apprentice, right? Who's replaced by Steve Waugh, who again is an apprentice. There's then the sort of, Ricky Ponting, um, uh, uh, apprentice, and then Michael Clark apprentice. But in the middle of all that, there's also an Adam Gilchrist vice captain goes back to that original model. So if, if you look at just the Australian length of this, that it's like, there's no, I don't think, I, I, I think a lot of it is who is a person in the team who is not going to be dropped. <laughs> right. And are we trying to groom the next captain yes. or are we trying to just support them? So if you look at the Michael Clark, Ricky Ponting situation, and you could probably say the same with the Steve Waugh, Mark Taylor situation. Those weren't particularly good vice captains because I don't think they made their captain feel particularly safe at all times. 
right? I think there were times yeah. where they probably actually make their captain feel unsafe. But at the same time, Australia was looking forward and going, oh, well, what actually what we want here is to make sure that um, we have the next captain available to us. And this is who it's obviously going to be. Whereas there have been other times in Australian cricket where they've gone, do you know what? This person's going to captain for a while. What we really need is a vice captain here who just backs them up. And that's literally all they do. So it depends on maybe the situation, the team, of, of in which direction you go. There is like no one perfect vice captain because it is such a weird role because it has to fit in with whatever the main piece is anyway. Yeah, I think so. I mean, the, the very best example of that supportive vice captain, I think, is going back to a man I mentioned earlier, would be would be Bob Wyatt, because he's vice captain to a guy who's doing something that's pretty. Uh, to say it's pretty contentious is the biggest understatement in cricket history. So, <laughs> Douglas contentious Jardine, within his team, along with Percy Fender, we're led to believe. Yeah, <laughs> well, indeed, which is why it was so important, you know, to have someone like Bob Wyatt. I mean, contentious within his team, yeah, a quizzling traitor, Gubby Allen being the most obvious example mm. of somebody who was against that. But, yeah, you're right, there are a couple of other batters as well who were a little uneasy about it, and certainly the, the team manager was. So having a vice captain who is a conduit into the players and is steadfast and adamant that his captain is right to do this thing that is really contentious, which is a bit like, actually, when Owen Morgan decided to transform the way England played one-day cricket and to go sod it, we're going to try and score 350-plus every time when, you know, the Ian Bell, Alastair Cook generation were limping their way to 260 and thinking that red ball bowlers would win them the match. Uh, if you're going to tear up the template that a side has played by, I think a vice-captain is important in that. Well, I say a vice captain's important in that. The role of vice captain has been the one that, that has been traditionally important for that. I guess my question is, is it utterly anachronistic? I mean, do vice captains operate like that outside the kind of Anglosphere, by which I mean, you know, England, Australia, to a lesser degree, New Zealand? I mean, in, in India and Pakistan... I don't really know about vice captains being significant, except I believe that Anil Kumble was made vice captain at a time when Varenda Sewag might have been agitating for a, a bigger role as captain. So by making somebody else vice captain, you're kind of saying, no, no, Viru, you know, get, get back in the queue. You're a long way to go. Do you know what I mean? So it's almost like the vice captain there isn't really doing anything except blocking an ambitious player. Yeah, I think there's a lot of ceremonial vice captains that that is kind of their job. And if they were to lead in a specific test match, uh, you know, the team would still go out on the field and generally the right bowlers would come on at the right time and the fields would be in the right position, right? I think there's a lot of that. So India's an interesting one because when I Googled vice captains, I'll go through the full uh, <laughs> the full list of all the different things I found when I was, when I was looking up vice captains. But the the cricket board who announces vice captains the most these days is the BCCI. I found dozens of, you know, Richard Pant to be announced vice captain tomorrow and all this sort of stuff. And that really isn't a thing of other nations. Um, I always felt, and, and if you go back to Sri Lanka, for instance, on, on a day-to-day -day basis, it was kind of hard to remember if Mahela was captain or Kumar was captain, right? But you knew that the two of them... <laughs> sort yeah. of form that sort of one headed snake and that, you know, that they both played those roles at different times. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think it has been the, the one that I got, I, I talked to Ash. Uh, I didn't take talk to Ashwin. It would have been a huge, I promise you anyone watching this or listening to this, I did not talk to our Ashwin about this. I talked to Barrett Sundaresan about the Ashwin situation. There was a point at which it, there was thought that Ashwin was too threatening to the leadership of Virat Kohli in that way that we talked about before with Ooh. Michael Clark or Steve War, in that he, and, and I, if, it's really interesting. He's a Michael Clark is another very, very similar to Ashwin, like an Uber tactician, right? That was Michael Clark's, you know, wasn't very good at leading his men and probably wasn't very good at organizational structure or any of the other stuff you need to be as a captain, but purely on where to put fielders, where to make bowling changes, which are the things that we, we judge most captains on, even if it's a far more complicated job than that. And I think Ashwin is quite clearly, that is his strengths as well, right? And so there was a feeling there. So I, he was demoted from that. And then when Rahane 
was demoted from the vice captaincy. That was another big deal. So, um, and I think I'm trying to, there was a few articles I found about whether Hardik Pandya was going to be a vice captain. It wasn't that particularly easy to find that. And when I asked a couple of friends who, and when I say friends, I mean uber nerds like us, if they could name the world's vice captains at the moment, the absolute lock, look of horror on their face of them having to go, um, okay. Uh, and even if I asked them about the team they were covering, they might have known one format, maybe two formats. And then by the third format, they were like, I don't know if they have a vice captain in one days or T20. And so there's absolutely no doubt that it has changed. And, but I think you're right. I think it does come from the, the Anglo side of things. Well, here's one for you. I, I, I went to Wikipedia, right? And when I went to Wikipedia, Daniel Norcross, what I expected to see was reams and reams of information mm -hmm. about the history of vice captains. And specifically what I expected to see was some sort of a, a, a military angle, right? So vice admiral is a term I've heard. I think that, you know, that yep. sounds like something. And so I expected it to be something along those lines. Actually, what I found was a paragraph of information on Wikipedia under the, the term vice captain. Um, and they've named here five sports. They've got vice captain of association football, which is that just the premier league before it was the premier league? Yeah, the, the association football. Yeah. It's soccer basically, but I mean, it, it, that's English incredible, soccer. isn't it? Because the captain, yeah, well, the, the, the captain in English soccer does absolutely nothing except wear an armband and then hand it over to the next person who walks onto the field when he's substituted off. Um, and so what the hell the vice captain does in soccer is anybody's guess. I mean, well, we, nothing. Yeah. No, definitely. Think. They put the armband on when the other person's not wearing the armband. It's such an important position there. Um, uh, Aussie mm. rules football. So that's taken directly from cricket would be my guess. Um, you obviously have cricket. Okay. You then have ice hockey. Now, at ice hockey, they call it the alternate captain, not the vice captain, uh, which seems a little bit weird for me, but okay, it's ice hockey. The other one is curling. Now, in curling, it's got a great name. They're called the vice skip. Yes. Now, in curling, I can make absolute sense of it because I've watched a lot of curling um, in my time. The great Rona Martin, for example, an Olympic champion back in some time ago. And the, the vice skip actually does have a role insofar as the skip and the vice skip consult about shots every time about tactics because obviously there's a whole load of different ways of playing curling so there's an agreement that's made between the skip and the vice skip and i can sort of see why that would happen also you know if the skip gets injured it is absolutely vital because the skip is is crucial in curling yeah i'm, I'm suddenly like sounding messianic about curling aren't i but but it in, in, in a way that in football, it absolutely isn't. But you do need like an on-field captain because you've got to make specific decisions in a way that you don't make them, frankly, in football. You know, the game's more mm. fluid. So it's a set piece occasion. You've got to decide what it is that you're going to do at this moment on this set piece. So that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Which are the other ones? That's it. That's the entire history of vice captains. However, I should say wow. that... The Ryder Cup teams have vice captains. Now, they're not on the Wikipedia page. So my guess is that there are a couple of other sports that probably still have them. But I think it's pretty clear that all the sports that have them, there's a link back to cricket. So cricket is obviously where captain slash vice captain becomes a thing in sport because association football, Australian rules football, and even if you think of ice hockey and curling as Canadian-led sports at times, they all would have had a link back to cricket. So it seems to me quite clear that this does come from cricket. And as you said, in curling, it makes sense to have kept it. I don't know what an alternative cap alternate captain would do in ice hockey um, that, that is needed. The interesting thing here is the Aussie Australian rules football angle because... They do have vice captains in Australian rules football, but over the last 10 or so years, they've actually, or 20 years, really, they stopped really talking about vice captains and they started talking about leadership groups, right? And if that seems common to you, that's around the mm -hmm. same time we started talking about it in cricket, because a lot of things in cricket have come from uh, Australian rules football, right? You know, the two are really, really directly linked. In, in, in fact, including my favorite thing that the IPL 
um, the IPL uh, final system is taken from Australian rules football. That's how linked. There are so many things, especially when it came to things via the ICC that have come from 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 footy in Australia. So those all those things make sense. The interesting thing here here is that no one has ever taken long enough to write more than a paragraph. I mean. Let, let's just can we look this up in real time yeah daniel norcross on wikipedia do you have a wikipedia page or have i just like british broadcaster you I, do, have, I do have a wikipedia page yeah yeah you have more words on your wikipedia page than the history of vice captains in sport yeah that, that is extraordinary isn't it so uh, because because, I mean, as I said earlier, the, the, the role of vice-captain has obviously had an importance for the players themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, for Boycott, it is, it is genuinely um, heart-rending, the passages in, in his book, when he's overlooked for the role of vice-captain. Like, it was something that actually mattered, and it was something that signalled something about his future, about how much he was respected and loved by the selectors, his teammates. Um, it was what gave him confidence it what it's what um gave him an indicator of what his future development path was likely to be you know a little bit like when you get an end of year appraisal and you get promoted to being something and so you can see the path that you're going on it's like for the players themselves the vice captain has an importance and as we also mentioned you know that had actual practical significance when you take 17 relatively young men on tour to places where there's lots of cheap booze and um, <laughs> and attractive people who want to spend time with them, um, and and who don't necessarily particularly want to train. So there, there are roles like that. I mean, but in a sense, the English vice captain for a long time is that Jonathan Liu said this to me. I was calling, I was talking to him about something completely different. I mentioned vice captains, and he said the quintessential English vice captain is Sergeant Wilson out of Dad's Army, and I thought that is that is a beautiful observation. Mm. It, you know, it it's this kind of um, manage up and down and sideways kind of role. It is deeply diplomatic. You know, you know that your boss is an idiot, but you know that he needs to have some kind of authority, and so you need to actually act as a buffer zone between his idiocy or his martinet behaviour or whatever, and and the troops down below. Um, and so it's, it sort of feels quite, when he said that, I sort of thought, yeah, there's something slightly militaristic about this. I know there isn't an actual vice captain, but there is a vice admiral. It's just that, you know, the captain is actually an admiral, really, in, <laughs> in, in the case of a cricket team. He, he has that much power, doesn't he? Or she. Mm. So um, th there was something kind of militaristic and hierarchical about it, which is also what made me think that in India particularly, I thought I would have known more about vice captains because there is something quite hierarchical there, isn't there, in, in, in Indian structures? Um, well, I, I found it very whereas, interesting that, like, a lot less so in the West Indies. Yeah, know? yeah, I, I did find it very interesting that they were still making the BCCI was still making large pronouncements about it, and that it was still saying. So there's a really interesting one that, in fact, Barrett gave me this one as well, which I'd forgotten. There was a point at which. Tim Payne was captain of the Australian team. Pat Cummins and Travis Head were vice captains. So they were announced as joint vice captains, which is that sort of leadership group that we're, you know, more familiar with yes. in, in cricket now, right? Now, yes. Travis Head then gets dropped. And there is no announcement on the fact that Travis Head has lost his vice captaincy, but he's not in the team. Then Travis Head gets re-promoted, but no one ever talks about whether he was vice captain again after that point. So is he still a vice captain? Do you lose it when you're not in the team? How does that even, you know, how does that sort of stuff even work? And it shows that, you know, to go back to the point that you, me and Rory really care about this sort of stuff. And, and you know, Barrett's probably another, that's why I went to Barrett because he's another person who cares about that sort of stuff as well. Mm. Legitimately, most people do not, it's just not even a thing. Most cricket writers are not even looking at it. And there was another point that I wanted to make to you. You and I, especially as commentators, but also I, I just, you know, when I'm in the press as a writer, we quite regularly receive team sheets, right? Sometimes someone will actually print out a yes. team sheet and put it in front of you. Um, on other occasions, you just get the WhatsApps and you have them on your phone. It's really, really rare now to see a vice captain listed on a team sheet. I would say for international cricket, 
less than 5% of the time where I'd seen them. I can't remember ever seeing a vice captain listed on a franchise team sheet, for instance. I, I, yeah, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I can't remember the last time I saw vice captain. On a, I, can't, I can't remember seeing a team sheet with vice captain on it, to be honest with you. Um, I want, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think, I don't think I can remember that. You know, even at a time when there was quite a high profile loss of vice captaincy, which is uh, when Ben Stokes was um, out of the England side because of the shenanigans in Bristol and then he came back. And he was no longer vice captain, wasn't he? I think Jimmy Anderson might have been made vice captain, a great example of a vice captain who has no captaincy ambitions, or if he does, is never going to have them sated because he was never going to be made captain. But I think Stokes was quite wounded by no longer being vice captain. Um, but we only knew that really from uh, sort of you know one little email that arrives in your inbox, just confirming that the vice captain um, Ben Stokes is back inside, but the vice captain remains James Anderson. You think, oh, okay. Um, so it's it's sort of it's yeah. You you would never get it on a team sheet. You never see it really on um, on scorecards, do you? You see the captain. You see the wicket keeper. You don't see the vice captain. It's no. It's it's, I, it's a very so, opaque place. Mm, I think the scorecards thing is really interesting because if you look at old scorecards, vice captain is quite often mentioned, right? And I think that when Crick Info in the nineties started uploading all the scorecards, that someone or maybe a few different people decided not to list the vice captains at that stage. And so that it's not in the Crick Info database and the Crick Info database basically more or less becomes the Cricket Archive database at that point, because that was started by a, a person who also was involved with Crick Info. The Crick Buzz database, I'm not sure if that's from Crick Info as well, but my guess is that how many, it would cost you a lot of money to get all the Cricket scorecards put online. It would be much easier to get someone to scrape them from Crick Info. Um, which is what most people do now anyway. So if Crick Info made a decision to not have the vice captain on the scorecards, um, then in some ways they have accidentally, and these were just amateur fans, like, you know, a bit like when you, you know, you started Test Match Sofa and I started mm -hmm. blogging, it was at that level. If they have made that decision, they've probably erased it even further at that point. And it means that going forward, we don't have anything. So there's two things in cricket we don't have any numbers on, which is we don't know who has been the vice captain who has vice captain the most. And we also don't have numbers on coaches. So we don't have the exact number of games that any coaches have coached because we just don't have those in, 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 no one keeps track of either of those things. And in vice captain's case, I think we could have. My guess is, and it is just a guess, Mr. Norcross, is that, um, Jax Callis mm -hmm. is probably the player who has vice captain the most. If you could think of anyone better, I'm more than happy to uh, insert them ahead of him. Well, there's a very good reason why it would be him. Um, I mean, Graham Smith was captain for the longest continuous period of time that I can think of, 90-odd test matches for South Africa. Uh, Callis played nearly all of those games. Um, he, would have been, he would have been exactly the perfect kind of vice captain we were talking about the person who is never going to get the job you're never going to make jack callis actually captain are you i mean <laughs> decision making and all that uh yeah. so yeah i mean he would be kind of like the perfect south african vice captain and yeah i would imagine yeah i i, I, I can't think of anybody i mean maybe over a long period of time who might have been vice captain to say charlotte edwards for england I just that can't imagine might be that, someone who would. Yeah, I can't imagine there was any woman who would be vice captain for long enough. I was thinking of women's cricket as well. So certainly, I mean, it's certain it, when it comes to tests, they wouldn't have played enough tests. But obviously, limited overs games would be quite interesting. Um, I, I wouldn't have thought. I wouldn't have thought there are that many eight-year vice captains in men's or women's international cricket. No, I think Nat Siver might get quite close to it as a vice to Heather Knight. Um, obviously not within Test cricket, but uh, in terms of one day internationals. And fascinatingly, of course, um, she has not really enjoyed captaincy experience and is taking a break from the game while Heather Knight's not there, which is a, a terrific example of the kind of vice captain we, we were talking about earlier, the sort of uh, the support vice captain as opposed to the ambitious vice captain.
So I, so I asked a bunch of friends and see if, if you can add anything here. When I asked what the greatest vice captains, I got Shane Warne, Rod Marsh, again, on my T-shirt. You can buy this from Bodyline T-shirts if you want to. Uh, Jeff Marsh, Callis, Ooh. Mahela Kumar, yeah. uh, Rahul Dravid, Alistair Cook, and Mark Taylor were the names that came up more than once, right? And it's interesting because the Shane Warne thing is, I think you could make a really good case that Shane Warne was a terrible vice captain. Mm. Because Make that he, case for clearly, me. he clearly, clearly wanted to be captain uh, to a point that it, he thought of himself as the leader. He, he disrupted Steve Waugh as a captain, and then he disrupted Ricky Ponting as a captain because he thought he could do a better job as a leader. I, I, I think that makes him, it makes him, what do they call him, the best captain that never existed. That is a different term. But as a vice captain, I would say someone like Shane Warne probably isn't as much used to you as someone like Jeff Marsh or Jarvis Callis is, who are just going to go with the flow a little bit more. I think the perfect one is probably someone like Raul Dravid, though, I was thinking, where Raul Dravid is going to give you tactical support, but at the same time, um, he can take over and actually lead the team. So he's almost the the, the dual um, uh, skill guy isn't he? he he can be you know he can be a captain and will be accepted yeah. as a captain but probably Raul Dravid isn't sitting there going I want to be captain he's probably sitting there going if I could be vice captain for the rest of my time and just that that would be perfect for me yeah I mean the thing with Raul Dravid is though that he's sort of perfect in so many ways that he would be <laughs> he would be you know he's your perfect middle order batter he's your perfect vice captain if it was if push came to shove he'd probably have been a very very good captain as well you know over a long period of time so, I mean, Raul Dravid is just an all-round awesome human being. And so you kind of expect him to take to this slightly nuanced role, especially one that the very best ones at it are the ones who can take ego out of what it is that they're doing, which is not an easy thing to do for sports people because, you know, it, it shouldn't really need saying, but being very good at sport does come with a fair bit of ego. Yeah, no, exactly. And... The other thing that I did, and I'm just going to assume that you've never played fantasy cricket uh, at this point, because why would you have? It doesn't seem like a Daniel Norcross thing. Well, that I've never been vice captain. No, I'm sure. Well, you would be a terrible vice captain, let's be honest. But no, fantasy cricket. Did you ever play? Have you ever played fantasy cricket? Yeah. And I don't, when I say fantasy cricket, I mean the online version, not the bit where you, you made your own fantasy cricket when you were 12 and you were struggling to find friendship groups. No. I absolutely have not played um, fantasy cricket. I, I, I'm forced to play fantasy football on my podcast. So fantasy cricket is interesting because when I search vice captains, Dan, that is actually the thing that comes up the most, right? So that on, on Google, I got again and again, all these different, uh, every, no matter what sort of different version with the hyphen, without the hyphen, um, if I looked for vice captain, I came up. So in some ways, the very most modern format of cricket, this fantasy thing where you can build your own cricket side is quite important. And the reason is in fantasy cricket, you get double points for a captain and you get, I think it's a point and a half for any v vice captain you have. So you have all these franchise leagues in the world who don't really have vice captains at all, and certainly no one in, in an official cap capacity. But when you're playing fantasy cricket, you actually do have someone who you get extra points from by selecting as your vice captain. Yes. Yes. I mean, that is, that's obviously within the rules of this ridiculous game, and I, I'm familiar with it from fantasy football. But mm. maybe, just maybe, it'll mean that we'll get the comeback of the vice captain. And, and well, when I say comeback, yeah. I don't think anybody knows what that would look like because no one really knows what the <laughs> vice captain is there precisely to do in the first place. But it means that we might be able to restore to some kind of honour this role that nobody really understands. Well, just on that, like the, the one thing that I thought was quite interesting is that Yes, I thought the same thing. I, I thought, I wonder if going ahead, vice captains are more important because so many young fans grow up picking vice captains for fantasy teams and how that comes in. But the other thing is that a vice captain basically has one role, right? Which is when the captain is not on the field or is not picked for a game or he's not fit or whatever has happened, the vice captain steps up. We're in a situation, Dan, where captains miss probably more games now due to personal reasons, parenting reasons, mental health, physical health, resting whatever it may be i mean you, remember Andrew, alistair cook's first job as captain was because andrew strauss didn't want to go to bangladesh right and i think that was for me that was probably one of the yep. first modern restings of a player who was a captain um, fr from a thing so in some ways vice captains are actually 
in international cricket, more important than they've ever been because you're not sure if your captains are always going to be around. And yet, actual vice captains have never been more erased from the cricket conversation. Do you know, that's exactly... I think that you have summed up basically exactly why Rory and I were desperate to find out who England's captain was going to, vice captain was going to be because England's current captain, Ben Stokes, of the test team at any rate, is a man who bowls himself for extraordinarily long spells has got a wonky knee, um, is, I say, prone to injury, has, gets injuries because he bowls too much, he bats too much, and he, and he puts himself through too much. So uh, it was a perfectly legitimate question to want to know who was going to be captain in the event that he has to miss a game and has to be rested. And we are still, uh, certainly in the England setup, absolutely none the wiser. Out of you and Rory, you, do you think Rory is a good vice captain to your, to your captain? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he, he just about keeps my feet uh, grounded in important moments, but um, he, he understands exactly the direction of travel. And uh, I, I think he will occasionally provide me with the odd useful steer, which I do occasionally, you know, sometimes take. Um, he has his ear to the ground. He knows what Hoy Poloy are getting up to because he hangs around with, with the writers. Obviously, he's a broadcaster. You find yourself slightly... Aloof, you know, we're the ones who who are having the champagne reception with uh, with the ambassador, whereas you know the, the scribblers are still late at night working on their copy. So it is important to have your ear to the ground and, and know what um, what the underlings are thinking. And, and Rory's exceptionally good at that. He is Bob Wyatt to my Douglas Jardine. Thanks for coming on my podcast, and also this is on your podcast. So thanks for coming on your own podcast. Yes. Yeah, which is which is delightful, isn't it? It's like a, it's a bonus. It's a bonus England cricket podcast. Which um, yeah, we must do this more often, Jared. Yeah, it was fun. I, I, I do you remember when I first asked you to do this podcast, and you went, "I couldn't think of talking about anything worse." <laughs> <laughs> well, I think actually my exact line was, "That sounds like a lot of hard work," <laughs> which you correctly interpreted to mean I can't think of anything worse. <laughs> <laughs>